Great. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is John Burke, and I'll be moderating and hosting today's discussion on bonding in extreme conditions with our friends at Huntsman Advanced Materials. So uh, during the webinar, we're going to be going over how to select and apply these adhesives, uh, structural bonding in high and low temperatures, as well as adhesive solutions for wet and humid conditions like underwater applications. So uh, we'll also during this presentation, we'll be performing some live demos with the Huntsman team out in Texas. And uh, so before we get into all of that, I do want to introduce everybody. First, I'd like to welcome Andrew Morris. Andrew is a national sales manager here at Chemical Concepts. Andrew, how are you doing? Oh, doing great, John. Hey, everybody. Joining him and, and with the presentation and the demos is going to be Matt Freeman, and he's uh, actually Huntsman's technical service manager. So, Matt, how are you doing? Doing good. Great. And later on, we're going to be joined by Matt Pogue. He's uh, Huntsman's senior account manager who will be, be joining us for the Q&A section later on. So uh, before we get into everything, before we get into the, the presentation, I do want to let everybody know we will be monitoring the Q&A boxes in Zoom. So if you see that Q&A box in there or the chat box, feel free to drop any questions during the presentation. Uh, we'll, we'll try to answer them either during or after in the Q&A section. Uh, we'll also be recording this whole, whole presentation. So afterwards, within 24 hours, you're going to be getting a recording of everything. Um, so you can come back and, and watch and, and go through the demos and, and see everything you need. So with that being said, Andrew, please feel free to leave the way. All right. Thanks, John. So welcome, everyone. Today's discussion is concerning solutions for bonding in really tough environments. Uh, so you have to, if you have to perform repairs in the field, uh, in all weather, or even out at sea, uh, perhaps you're a manufacturer and there are parts of your facility that are not climate controlled, uh, or maybe you're an engineer that needs an adhesive that can withstand the high temperatures of the powder coating process. Uh, whatever the case may be, uh, what we hope to accomplish today is to look at some of these extreme conditions that manufacturers uh, and repair professionals are facing today uh, and give you an idea of some of the technologies that are available to address those problems. Uh, by the time we're finished here today, you should have a good starting point um, in, in terms of what you might be looking for for next time you have an application uh, that requires joining materials in one of these uh, difficult environments. So for the agenda, we're going to be looking uh, at, at a high level overview and to discuss some of the industry trends that are influencing the need for high performance materials. Uh, then we're going to look at some of the products designed to handle extreme conditions. Uh, next is a live demonstration from the application lab at Huntsman Advanced Materials uh, in their headquarters in the Woodlands, Texas, uh, followed by a deeper dive into some specific case studies to give you a better idea about real world applications. Uh, and we will try to leave plenty of time for the Q&A section so that you'll have the opportunity to get your questions answered because uh, obviously those things are very important to, uh, to you. Uh, but before we dive in, I want to give you a, a very brief background on chemical concepts. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, we are product assembly people. Uh, so manufacturers and engineers of all kinds come to us when they have design challenges or applications where traditional fastening methods can't be used. Perhaps they're looking for some process improvement. Uh, at that point, we're able to leverage our expertise and our relationships with leading manufacturers like Huntsman uh, to provide solutions involving uh, adhesive, sealants, tapes, or specialty fasteners. And we do have a great team of subject matter experts to, to make those recommendations. Uh, we are active in various industries, including stone and solid surface fabrication, transportation, signage, composites, uh, as well as electronics uh, manufacturing. Uh, we are located in the Northeast of the United States in the Philadelphia area. And you can see that we've been around a long time, coming up on 60 years next year, actually. Uh, we recently became a Huntsman uh, regional distributor and uh, who was co-hosting this event with us today. And now Matt is just going to tell you a little bit more about Huntsman Advanced Materials. Matt? Thank you, Andrew. So just a quick uh, overview of Huntsman. We're, we're a global company, as you can see in the, on the map there. We have uh, offices, formulation sites, and synthesis sites across the world. And uh, we serve a lot of different markets. Some of those are aerospace, transportation, electronics, uh, construction, and commodity. And for each one of those, we have different solutions that we can offer uh, from composites, adhesives, or resins and coatings. So we really have a, a lot of different offerings to help solve any problems that you might have. Thank you, Andrew. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so there are several industry trends and market conditions that are driving the demand for products that can perform in what we might call uh, extreme environments. 
um, and driving demand for structural adhesives in general. So the first is light weighting. Uh, this is a long-term trend that's been taking place where we see heavier materials being replaced by lighter materials, more sophisticated designs, uh, hollow core materials, composites, et cetera. Uh, there are a lot of forces driving this as well. First is the availability of newer, lighter, stronger materials that make these designs possible. There are new manufacturing techniques. Uh, a lot of this is related to green initiatives that seek to reduce waste or reduce certain raw materials, lower the carbon footprint. And some of this is just cost or performance driven. Uh, but the bottom line is though, that this push for light weighting presents a lot of challenges for manufacturers and engineers where traditional joining methods like welding or screws or rivets might not be appropriate or even possible in some of these situations. Um, and this is related to, to my second point, which is uh, the joining of dissimilar materials. Uh, so today, more than ever, you're seeing so many new materials, so many different materials uh, in one finished product where you really need an engineered solution that can do the job. So many of these materials are going to expand and contract at different rates, looking at the uh, coefficient of thermal expansion. Uh, and these applications where the part is going to see a lot of movement that's an extreme condition uh, for an adhesive in its own right. Uh, the next trend is the replacement of mechanical fasteners. And that's really related to aesthetics and newer design standards uh, where people are really looking for clean lines, sleek designs, more visually appealing products. I'll use the example of uh, tractor trailers where uh, you see the older designs had rivets everywhere uh, on the side panels. If you're driving on the road, you might see newer designs uh, where structural adhesives are used to help reduce or eliminate all those exposed fasteners. Um, high heat and humidity, as well as low temperatures are also a condition uh, that manufacturers and repair teams are dealing with. Uh, while heat and humidity are certainly not new, uh, what is new are products with composites or thin gauge aluminum or dissimilar materials that are having to operate or be repaired in those conditions. Um, so that's certainly something uh, new that these teams are having to deal with and they need products to, uh, to help them do that. Uh, there are also a lot of pressures now to decrease cycle times and get equipment back in service with minimal downtime. So in the past, maybe that part might be brought back to the shop and be fixed. Now the expectation is, you know, can we repair this product and get it back in service ASAP if there is a solution to do that? Um, and lastly is underwater applications. So while demand to repair or assemble products in wet or damp or underwater conditions, you know, that demand has always existed. Products to join materials underwater have not been available until fairly recently. So this technology is getting better all the time. Uh, as new products come on the market that can perform underwater, that will change the game for people in marine repair, in pool repair, boat building, et cetera, who previously would have to either wait until the material was dry, drain the pool, move the product out of the water, or some similar step that could have considerable costs, which might now be uh, avoidable. Um, so going into uh, the, the process for assessing repairs, uh, when you're looking at repair applications, there are a couple stages in the process where better solutions can make a difference. So looking at each of these elements as cost centers, the question is then how can you reduce costs and optimize the resources within each cost center? So starting with the repair solution itself, so kind of starting on this uh, uh, fourth square over if you're, if you're following along, um, having access to a product that can function in a wide range of weather conditions, that's going to save costs and improve logistics and other headaches. Uh, instead of having to wait for the right conditions, you have more opportunities in a given year uh, to send the crew and get that rep uh, repair completed sooner than later, rather than waiting for the perfect day or, or missing a couple of days due to uh, poor conditions. So for example, if you have a product that can cure uh, in cold temperatures, you know, this would also affect the required support. So you might not need the heat guns or the other equipment to, to prep those materials. So this has cascading effects through these um, other areas. So this also relates to the repair team itself. So having greater flexibility allows you to deploy those resources where they're needed with less downtime. So you don't end up in a situation where expensive and highly skilled labor is idle or waiting for those better conditions. Uh, this also improves the ability to plan and make better assessments about what repairs can be completed and when. Um, so you see that once you have uh, solutions for these uh, different outcomes, uh, then it's much easier and, and these uh, filter down throughout the rest of the process and have other benefits. Um, so now we're going to highlight four products that have special characteristics that allow them to perform 
uh, in these difficult environments. So we're going to talk about the Arrow Light 2050, the 2051, the 2015 Dash One, and the 2019. So the 2050 and the 2051 are structural acrylic adhesives or MMAs. Uh, these products are fast curing, require virtually no surface prep, uh, bond to dissimilar materials, and have good weathering resistance. Uh, they can be used for a variety of applications, uh, and we'll look at some of these applications in a minute, but these just include sign fabrication, uh, replacing welding and riveting, and, and general product assembly. Uh, of these two products, the 2050 is the product that's better suited for the cold and wet applications. This product cures very quickly at room temperature, which allows for fast set times, even in cold temperatures. Um, and this product can be applied below freezing conditions and works underwater. Uh, so the general rule of thumb is for every 20 degrees movement from room temperature, you're going to either cut your working time in half or, or double it. So if you have an increase of 20 degrees in your uh, ambient temperature, you're going to cut your working time by basically by 50%. Uh, if you have a decrease in temperature, you're going to extend your working time by 50%. So by having a product that cures that fast, you know, say so showing two minutes pot life at room temperature, that's going to give you a comfortable amount of time to work with at these colder temperatures. Um, so for instance, if you're doing a repair or an installation in the Northeast, uh, you have a product that is ready for use even during those cold winter months. Um, once cured, this product can handle up to 240 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and you can see the tensile strength of the product is very high at uh, 5,800 PSI. Uh, the, uh, excuse me, the 2051 is the product that's better suited for warm and humid conditions. This product can be applied up to 104 degrees Fahrenheit, and it can be applied in and around salt water. Uh, besides the temperature range and the cure time, you can see the other specifications are similar to the 2050. Uh, and with that, we're going to go live to the Huntsman Advanced Materials Lab uh, in the Woodlands, Texas, for a demonstration of these products. Matt? Hi, we're here today at our Innovation Lab in the Woodlands, Texas, to demonstrate the Aerodite 2050 structural adhesive. This adhesive was designed to speed up bonding operations in the toughest assembly and repair environments. And it works even whenever you bond in very cold or humid conditions. So you can see here we have our bucket of ice. It has uh, two metal substrates in here, as well as the 2050. And you can see that the ice is at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So today I'll pull this out. I'll go ahead and pull off the top here, uh, put it in our dispensing gun, and get this brought into phase. As you can see, even at the very low temperatures, it dispenses very easily. So I put on our mix tip. Go ahead and squeeze out some to get this. Make sure it's all mixed thoroughly. You can see here how easily it dispenses. I'll pull out one of our metal strips that has been submerged. Lay a thin bead of adhesive across. And then stick this piece together. I'll just place that back into the ice. I have another sample here that I bonded just a couple hours ago. And you can see it's already built up very strong strength. So one of the ones that uh, we've done here is a uh, metal cabinet bonding with the Aerodite 2051. So if you need a fast, strong bonding, the Aerodite 2051 is a, a perfect choice. So this MMA, it has the benefit of needing little to no surface prep. And then uh, with its high heat resistant, it allows it to be used on parts that uh, will be assembled prior to being powder coated. And that ability to withstand that heat, it gives that adhesive uh, the ability to eliminate the need for mechanical fasteners, which allows for a smooth aesthetic design and uh, really was a benefit in this application. Another one that we've done here is a uh, bonding inside blade add-ons with the Aerodite 2051. So wind blade repair and add-ons uh, can be bonded with this adhesive because it's been approved for the specialized application. And because of the wide range of operating temperature, it allows bonding to be completed uh, year round, no matter what the weather is. It can be uh, hot or cold or humid or wet. And the, this adhesive is still able to get that job done. Uh, it's a non-tag formula, which allows that to be applied without uh, running or having 
uh, the ability to fill in gaps if the parts aren't uh, a perfect fit. And bonding and repair at sea. So this is an example of an extreme environment uh, where that needs to, the adhesive needs to be uh, very versatile. So once the boat leaves the shipyard, you know, it's gonna be exposed to a, a lot of different changing conditions. And if you're out in this, or if you're gonna need to make a repair in this, then you're gonna want to make sure that you have something that can handle all these different conditions. So a, a good thing to have, uh, some people will keep it on hand, just keep it somewhere on the boat as it's the small little 50 mil cartridges of this adhesive. And because it's so fast curing and it can be applied underwater and it's a, uh, lets you make those quick repairs when you need them and whenever you wanna make them. And with no surface prep needed and its ability to bond to multiple different materials, it makes it a really good adhesive for this application. Next, I'm gonna talk about our Aerodite 2015-1 adhesive. So this adhesive is really just a great multi-purpose adhesive. It has a long pot life. So that makes it a good choice for if you have medium or large parts to bond. And it's gonna uh, provide plenty of time to be able to lay down the adhesive before assembly. It's uh, very resistant to weathering and dynamic loading. And with its elongation of 4%, it uh, keeps it flexible enough that it can bond to similar materials very well. And it won't break apart when those materials move. And this is a, just a really good one to start with our customers. If they don't have a really good idea of what they need or what they want, um, this is a perfect one for it because it is so versatile and it can bond so many different materials. And it's also a very durable adhesive. So one of the interesting applications for this adhesive being an epoxy is uh, underwater pool repair. So this, uh, this one really shows the versatility of this adhesive because it allows you to save time and money by eliminating that need to drain the pool if you have any kind of repair or if you're trying to bond something under the water. And it provides a unique solution versus uh, the typical adhesives that are available, which they're usually more commonly MMAs that are very fast. They have a short pot life, so you really have to use them quickly. Uh, it gives us the ability to offer an, an epoxy solution that will have a longer open time to give you a little bit more time when working with it. And uh, so we're also going to do another demo here shortly uh, to show this adhesive in action. Okay, today we'll show you the Aerodite 2015-1 and how it can be applied to substrates underwater. So we have our 2015 cartridge here loaded into our dispensing gun. We add the nozzle onto the end here after we bring it into phase, of course. Attach the mixing nozzle. Go ahead and get some dispensed. Make sure it's mixed properly. We'll grab one of these substrates here and apply a thin bead underwater. Go ahead and apply the other one onto that adhesive. While that one cures, I have another substrate that I bonded uh, earlier today. As you can see, it's very strong strength already. Another application area that the 2015-1 has uh, been used on is in speedboat hold to deck bonding. So because of that long open time, it's the perfect adhesive for this large part where it's gonna be applied all the way across the, the entire boat outside perimeter. It's a thixotropic non-sag paste. So that's gonna allow you to put the adhesive where you want it to be. And it's gonna stay there. It's not gonna sag off. Um, it's gonna be perfect for that. And it's a very durable and able to withstand the, the dynamic loading that's going to be subjected to in this application. Once that beat, but that boat starts reaching these high speeds, it's going to be able to maintain uh, at long lasting bonds. Another one here is bonding traffic light assemblies. So it can also be used in a similar fashion with uh, sign and letter assemblies. It offers excellent adhesion to aluminum. And uh, because of that weathering resistance, uh, it, being exposed to the elements, it'll still be able to withstand those uh, 
withstand those uh, elements. And it creates long lasting bonds that can stand up to those vibrations that it'll see from, from wind and any other elements. The last adhesive we'll talk about is the Aerodite 2019. So this adhesive is the highest temperature resistance adhesive that we have uh, that we're gonna talk about today. And also as part of our core range of adhesives that I'll speak on a little bit later as well. This adhesive also provides the strongest bonds to composite parts that we have. Um, so anything that's gonna be like high-end composite parts, anything like uh, light weighting cars, uh, speed boats and drones, it's been used in those applications. And it also has the longest pot life of the adhesives that we uh, discussed today. So anything where you're going to have like really large parts, um, anything, if it's going to be these, you know, high end expensive composite parts, you're going to want to make sure that these parts are in place before they actually start to secure and bond together. So here's one example of using the Aerodite 2019 adhesive. So it's bonding a carbon bite frame. And this application, the goal was to keep the bite as light as possible uh, while maintaining resistance to high stress. So the, the manufacturer wanted this bike to have no stiffer reduction, even at elevated temperature, which made this adhesive the, the perfect choice for the job. And this example, it's a bonding composite parts of an airplane. So here we use the 2019 to create these uh, strong bonds using that composite parts on the like wings and different areas. Um, these parts are gonna be exposed to, you know, dynamic temperature environments and they're gonna need to maintain a very strong bond. And these parts can also be very large in size. So that's where the long open time is very helpful. Um, another added benefit to this adhesive is it has integrated spacer beads. So that's gonna make sure to, uh, keep that minimum bond line thickness. And um, it's gonna be very essential in this application to make sure that there's adhesive there and it's not starved in those bond lines. So today we talked about a few different uh, of our adhesives for specific extreme environments, but we also have a great core range of products to offer. So this uh, core range it offers three different chemistries and these adhesives are gonna be able to cover 90% of your bonding needs. And of this core range, we offer uh, epoxy, MMA and polyurethane solutions. And um, based off of the selection wheel, you can see the little graphic. This tool is used to help you select which adhesives that you need. So if you look at it closely, you can see here in the center, it says uh, pot life. So depending on how long you want this adhesive to be able to work before it starts to, to gel up, then you'll, you'll select that spot, either uh, less than 10 minutes, uh, 11 to 60 or greater than 60 minute pot life. And then you'll move to that second ring. That'll be the max operating temperature. So if you don't need it to have a, a very high operating temperature, then you can select one uh, in the lower range. And then you'll move to that next uh, outer ring, which shows if it's a plastic, a composite or a metal. And based off of those selections, you'll be able to find an adhesive that will match your application and needs. All right, so that's uh, that's uh, the core range for you. And all Andrew, right. I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so at this point, we have covered all the material on the agenda. Uh, if you would like to learn more or you think some of these products uh, might be a good fit, um, for any application that you're currently work on, working on, please reach out to us after the event. Uh, I do have contact information for both myself uh, as, as well as for Matt from Huntsman. Uh, our office number and our general email is uh, on here as well. Um, so me, myself, or any members of our team will try to assist you uh, right away if you do reach out to us. Uh, we do have a special promotion for attendees where we are offering 10% uh, off your first order. So if you're ready to get started, we can uh, you know, offer that uh, incentive for you. Um, we also have, uh, have, can work with you on samples or if you need to do some testing. And we are also offering free consultation where uh, we would like to learn more about your application and see if we can find a solution that, that, that meets your needs. So look out for a follow-up email that will be sent uh, in the next 24 hours uh, that will include a PDF copy of the slides that you're looking at, uh, as well as a recording, as John mentioned, of the whole event. That's a question that we get a lot. 
Um, so feel free to share that with anyone else in your organization once you have that, if there's other people on your team uh, where you think that this might be helpful. Um, also, all the links will work in the PDF copy. So um, if it's convenient for you to just write this down now, I do have it up on the screen, but uh, don't feel like you have to write it down. It, it will be there and you can just click the link uh, and make it very easy to, uh, to get in contact. Um, and then lastly, before we begin the q and I just did want to mention some other products that we offer uh, in case we could help you with anything else. Um, in addition to structural adhesives, uh, we also carry sealants, tapes, thread lockers, casting and molding materials, and specialty fasteners. Uh, many people working with structural adhesives might also have applications for some of these other products. So if you are having any challenges, we'd be happy to have a conversation and see if we can point you in the right direction uh, there as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John to uh, get us started with the Q&A. Great. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Andrew. Um, do you want to do want to reintroduce Matt Pogue? He's uh, the Huntsman Senior Account Manager. Matt, how you doing? Pretty good. And uh, big thanks to the Chemical Concepts team for arranging this uh, session here. It, I think it went really well. Um, you know, it's it's always great to have some live demos. Uh, big thanks to, to Matt Freeman here for for doing that. And uh, I think you know it, it's great when we get to see the uh, adhesives in action. So uh, again, big thanks to you guys. And I'm, I'm happy to be here and thank you for the invitation. Awesome. Well, uh, let's get into the Q&A then, guys. Um, I, I did get a couple questions during the presentation there. Um, a, a lot focusing on dissimilar materials. Um, Matt, I'll, I'll let you lead this off. We, we got a question here from an anonymous attendee. Uh, when talking about dissimilar materials, what kind of materials are related? So uh, this person brought up metal to composite, plastic to metal, aluminum to steel. What would be your generic answer in, 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 in that? <laughs> Well, I'll go ahead and take yeah. that one. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the dissimilar materials, it really covers all those. I mean, if, if you're going to be bonding any kind of metal to composites or even different types of composites together that might not, you know, be an exact match, then these adhesives are going to be able to withstand those those different changes and be able to bond both sides of it. Yeah, and the thing I would add there is, you know, the, the, the one big consideration, and that's something especially engineers ask us about a lot, is that, that, that uh, coefficient of thermal expansion. Um, so, you know, if you're not familiar, you know, all the different materials, they expand and contract at different rates. So if you have two materials and you're putting them next to each other uh, and you're trying to join them together, you have to be able to compensate for that. Um, so compared to say welding, which doesn't have, well, well, you know, if you're say, if you're doing say aluminum to stainless or even metal to composites, you know, welding isn't even an option uh, necessarily to begin with. Um, but whatever joining, you know, looking at uh, mechanical fasteners, you want to make sure that you're allowing for some of that movement. So if you, uh, you know, going through some of those specs, uh, all the adhesives have some movement capability um, some more than others. And I hope it's okay for you guys to plug the new material, right? But you have the 2053 that's coming out soon. Um, and that's going to be a material that's got even more uh, elongation, even more movement capability um, for an acrylic um, that uh, could come in handy in some of these situations where, you know, in some of these temperature extremes, you know, the longer that you have apart, you know, or the bigger the area that you have, you know, that thermal expansion can be more significant. So say if that thermal expansion is say, 10%, you know, 10% of a millimeter is still in absolute terms, a, a small number, that bigger that area gets, uh, that expansion can become more and more significant. So it becomes more and more important uh, to have an adhesive with, with a lot of flexibility. So uh, are, are you guys able, just to kind of a, a little tangent, are you guys able to talk about the 2053 at all? Uh, you know, I don't know if you guys would probably know better than me off the top of my, uh, your heads, what the uh, expansion rates or the, the elongation on that product is. Yeah, so uh, I don't have all the, the, <laughs> the data off the top of my head, but I do know the elongation on that one is going to be greater than 50%. So it is going to offer a lot of uh, ability to have that flexibility on these different materials that even with the high CTE, they'll be able to withstand that. Yeah, as it pertains to the question, I think you brought up a good point, Andrew, is that, you know, when you do have those dissimilar substrates, the CTEs are not going to match. And, you know, in, in the typical days, if you were bonding uh, composites with an epoxy formulation backbone, you typically want to use an epoxy adhesive so that CTEs would be somewhat similar. The 2053, we get around that issue because of the elongation and the toughness of the product. Uh, that's not as much of a concern right now. So you do get the benefits of, of EMMA chemistry, but you don't get the disadvantage of any type of delamination or adhesive failure. Yeah, so I think bottom line for the, the person that asked that question is, um, 
you, you know, if you have a specific combination of materials, uh, you know, let us know. We can help you select the right tool for that job. But almost, you, you know, almost any two materials, we probably have a solution that will work. We'll certainly let you know if we can't, but come to us with any application and uh, we'll certainly, you know, and, and as you can see, you, you've got a little bird's eye view into the lab there at Huntsman. So if, if we don't know for, if we don't have data, oh, you know what, we've never bonded, happened, we've never bonded fiberglass to stainless steel using this product. Let's see if it works. So we do have testing facilities and, and uh, those resources available depending on what you're doing. So that's where I kind of wanted to leave that there. Thanks guys. Um, got another question here from uh, Richard. We have, uh, nothing was mentioned on wood. Is there a specific product or, or recommendation or product line you guys would, would recommend for wood to metal, concrete, plastics? For, for wood, I don't know that we've done a lot of testing on. I'm sure, uh, I know they'll stick to wood. Um, I don't know about as far as the, the durability. That would be something that would have to be tested, of course, but uh, the adhesives will stick to it for sure. Yeah, I, I think that would probably come more down to the particular mechanical requirements of the application. So again, that's another opportunity to uh, interface with chemical concepts to provide some more detail about the specific application. And that would probably really help us determine on which uh, adhesive solution would be uh, the best for that particular um, bonding. Yeah, and, and if I could add something there, uh, just to speak in really general terms, um, you know, we've been, uh, we're, we're learning about the Huntsman products all the time. We, as I mentioned, we've only been a Huntsman uh, distributor for about three months now. This will be, so tomorrow will be the beginning of the fourth month. We started January 1st. So we're still kind of uh, learning all the intricacies of, uh, and the specifics of, and the peculiarities of, of their products. But just in general terms, in terms of the chemistry, so the, the chemistries that Huntsman offers, we have got epoxies, acrylics, urethanes, um, in our experience, a big when, when doing product selection, one of the things that we look at is, is porous versus non-porous substrates. Um, so what we usually advise customers, if, the, if you have a really porous substrate, then you know uh, epoxies tend to work better. Epoxies and urethanes tend to work better. The acrylics tend to work better on um, the non-porous substrates. So like uh, Wood, uh, sorry, plastics or metals uh, that, that don't have that porosity. So I would imagine that most of the hunts, and that's, you know, maybe there's exceptions here, there. Okay, here's an acrylic that just happens to stick really well to concrete or whatever. Uh, but I think in general terms, that's a good guideline, uh, not a rule. Um, and so for, for bonding wood, you know, you mentioned a couple of uh, combinations. So you say like uh, wood to metal. So in general, I would say probably an epoxy would be the best solution to that. And then we could kind of work with you to figure out which epoxy is maybe uh, the best, best fit. And then if you're doing to say uh, wood to uh, a, uh, like a plastic or wood to a non-pore substrate um, other than metal, cause actually the urethanes don't bond metal fantastic. So that's why I said an epoxy, uh, but a urethane would also be a good choice. So say if you're doing wood to plastic um, or wood to composite or something like that. Uh, we've had good results. Um, so ho hopefully that helps. Yeah, and speaking on the, the concrete portion, uh, we did have an application with the, a customer that was using concrete onto a composite part and uh, it was the 2015-1 and they had great results with it. It did everything they wanted and uh, it's an outside application. So that weathering for the 2015 was a big help for them as well. Yeah, and, and then with wood, I mean, obviously the different hardwoods, they're very, you know, a lot of, you know, it's a big uh, umbrella term. So, you know, teak is obviously a very different wood than, you know, pine, especially for those of you in the marine industry, you know, the, the special properties of teak. So, um, but in general, like the more porous woods, the softer woods, um, it's, it's definitely an easy material to bond. So I, I wouldn't have a lot of concern about that. It's got those big open pores, the epoxy, if it's a lower viscosity epoxy, it can kind of flow in there. And, and usually if we do destructive testing or something like that, you're seeing material failure, you're seeing, you know, you're pulling wood off of, uh, uh you know, you're pulling material off of that wood. Um, so you, generally it's the other side, you know, that's, that's going to be the limiting factor is the material itself, basically. Great. Thanks guys. Uh, another question here, um, you had mentioned, uh, this was a, another anonymous attendee, uh, which products should be used when bonding aluminum and then powder coating? I, I know we talked about an application. Great question. Um, but can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on the powder coating and, and what product you would use? 
Yes. Yeah, so the the Aerodite 2050, 2051, they have had examples of where they were uh, bonded and then powder coated. And then also our new adhesive that we mentioned just a little bit earlier, the 2053, it's also been used in that application as well. And it's going to be able to withstand those temperatures, um, at least for, you know, the time that it's in the powder coating. Yeah. So that's a that's a, that's another, uh, I kind of mentioned it up front, but I don't think we had a specific case study that went into that, but that's a great extreme condition that's, that's pretty common. Um, and, you know, we talked about like weather and like natural events, but, you know, a lot of people are, are and manufacturers are looking for um, products that can withstand the different processes that they have in, in their, uh, you know, in their assembly process. So if it has to survive the e-coating process or the powder coating process, uh, or maybe there's a, a, a heat, another heated element for another part of the process that it needs to survive. So, so that's, a, that's important as well. And we have a, a, a with a variety of pieces. We have a, a lot of experience with applications where powder coating is is part of the process. And the especially looking at the data sheet, uh, you mentioned the twenty fifty one and the twenty fifty three. Is that right? Is that what you guys mentioned? Yes. Yeah. So if you look at the high temperature resistance on that product, you might immediately look at it and say, "Oh, that's that is." I think it says two hundred and eighty five degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. Um, you might say, "Oh, it doesn't go hot enough," but that's a that's a prolonged temperature. So it can ha handle higher temperatures for an intermittent period of time, right? Um, so the one thing we advise customers, usually if you talk to your powder coater, if you're sending this out, if you either have control of the powder coating process, that's great. If you're sending it out, usually you can request that they, you know, the powder coating process will still work at a range of temperatures. So we just try and advise people to keep it under 400. So we've had a lot of success with customers that are powder coating parts using adhesives and they've run those powder coating ovens um, at like 385, 390, something like that. Try and keep it under the 400 mark if you can. And the other rule of thumb that we tell people is what's gonna happen is that adhesive is gonna soften. And then after it comes out of the powder coating oven, that's gonna re-solidify and go back to its cured state. Um, but while it's soft, you know, once it's re-hardens, it's actually stronger than it was before that post baking actually helps some of the cross linking. Um, but while it's in that heated state, it's gonna be a little bit soft. So I wouldn't hang parts directly from, so if you're bonding a clip on, you know, don't hang the whole part from a clip uh, that you just bonded. Make sure that you have a secure area um, that hang the part from because you know the performance of the adhesive will temporarily be lower. If you pull that thing out of the oven and immediately try and pull that part off, you probably could. But after it comes down to room temperature, you'll have no, uh, you know, no change in the long-term performance. So that's just an important uh, tidbit for any of you that are looking at powder coating products. Just a question from my side. I mean, we, we have plenty of people that will call us about, um, you know, post powder coating. Is there a product you guys would recommend for something after the powder coat process that to bond, you know, the parts together? Um, I, we have a lot of different adhesives that could work on that, but, uh, on the powder coating itself, it's probably gonna need still some kind of surface prep, most likely, to be able to get that long lasting durable bond because it's not gonna bond directly on that and just be able to work right off of it. It's gonna need some kind of surface prep onto that to get that adhesive to work. Yeah, those, those powder coating, you know, some of those uh, formulations that can be very slick, very low surface energy. Um, so, you know, even like a light scuff and some kind of uh, uh, alcohol cleaning um, and, you know, generally we could have good results, whether it's before or after uh, the powder coating process. And, uh, um, you know, in terms of chemistry, I think we've used your, you know, some of the urethane stick to powder coat pretty well. Um, you, you guys, do, I don't know if you know offhand with the uh, acrylics, do you have good results on sticking, at least after they're prepared to sticking to powder coat? Yeah, I think uh, we've had a few different examples with it being applied to that and uh, had pretty good results, but yeah, it's usually at least some kind of surface prep. If, if anything, like you mentioned, a wipe or something or a light scuff, something to, to give it something to hold on to to be able to make that bond. Yep. Perfect. I got a question here from Robert. Thank you, Robert. Uh, he said, I'm interested in adhesives that have glass spacer beads integrated into them. Uh, do, does Huntsman carry a product that uh, can adhere plastic to aluminum that has these, these glass beads in them? The two of our adhesives on the, the core range do have those glass space beads already integrated in, which is the 2031-1 and the 2019 that I spoke about. And both of those should have a good adhesion to aluminum. And uh, did you say onto plastic? Yeah, he, he mentioned plastic to aluminum. 
Okay. Uh, I don't have that in there. Um, hey, hey, Robert, if you're still with us, could you, do you know what type of plastic that you have? But uh, while we might be getting an answer to that, so let's, I'll just throw it a, a hypothetical at you. So say it's like, say, ABS or acrylic or a, a pretty common plastic like that. I mean, what would you yeah. say there? Would one of those two products work well? So with those two, yeah, depending on how strong of a bond you want, um, both of those products will work on those materials. We do have data on those in the TDS. So um, depending on how high you need that lap shear strength or um, any tensile strength to be, then uh, those would be two possible options. Yeah. So the really tough plastics, as, as some of you guys might know, are like the polyolefin, so like the HDPE and the uh, polypropylene, PTFE, even nylon is kind of tough to stick to. I don't know if you you know, you guys can tell me if you feel like the uh, either of those two products would stick well to nylon. Uh, but in general, those are the, the kind of tougher products that we commonly run into. And you, you either need a special product for that or at least a special treatment um, you know, like you could do Corona treatment or plasma treatment on HDPE. That'll give you, that'll help prepare the surface and give you uh, good results. Yeah, that's the key right there, especially with the uh, low engine substrates. It, it really comes down to the, the, really the mechanical requirements of the, the application. Um, and then also what surface treatments are available um, to be uh, conducted onto the substrates themselves, because that can make a big difference on your adhesion, uh, especially yeah. those materials. Yeah, something else I wanted to add is, uh, here's another concept for you. Uh, something else that Chemical Concepts sells as an accessory, we actually sell little bottles of glass beads um, that are almost like in a little salt shaker. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of lower tech than having an adhesive that's got the glass beads already mixed in. Uh, but that does give you the flexibility to use any adhesive that you want. You could just you know lay a bead down, your operator could have a little bottle of glass beads, You know, just pour a small amount on there, uh, You know, maybe in your process, uh, depending on how tightly controlled, you know, if you're doing medical devices, you want everything dosed out, you know, maybe you can't do that. But uh, depending on the, the requirements, if it's easy for you to just sprinkle some glass beads on the top, and then when you bond those parts together, uh, I would think you'd get pretty similar performance. And we do have customers that have done those kinds of applications. Uh, so the, the glass beads that we carry, um, they're 10 mil glass beads. So it's 10 thousandths of an inch, um, which is really a good bond line thickness for most adhesives where uh, you'll get that consistent uh, bond line thickness that you're looking for. So uh, another option for you, if, if the exact adhesive that you'd want to use is not available with glass beads. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, Derek asked a question. Thank you, Derek. Um, he said, uh, he mentioned that the, the core range chart that we showed on the, one of the last side, slides there uh, was most interesting to him. Um, Derek, we can send this to you, but can you elaborate a little bit? I know you kind of went through it quickly, but can you elaborate a little bit more on how to work that that core range chart that you have, that wheel? Yeah, yeah. So I can uh, kind of go back over that again. So you can see the, the three different rings. The inside ring is where you would start at. That's the pot life. So depending on how long you want that adhesive to be workable before it starts to gel is where you'll go from there. And so once you know that, then you can pick which section of that ring it falls in. So for instance, if it's a 10 minutes, uh, you go from uh, less than 10 minute pot life, you'll move out to that second ring and that's the max operating temperature. So on there, it has three different sections for the, the operating temperature that you'll need your adhesive to withstand. And that's a, when we say operating temperature, that's it, any uh, temperature that'll be exposed to consistently, it can withstand those temperatures. So like uh, Andrew mentioned, we, we can get beyond that for short periods of time, but if you want that consistent operating temperature that's where you'll go for that second ring and after you have those two sections picked out you'll move up to that third ring where it has the composites metal or plastic and uh it shows right above that the little grade in section will be the adhesive that fits into that that distinct area so that meets all three criteria yeah so this gives you a great starting point but then of course you know feel free to lean on us and lean on the huntsman people you know, if you have a specific application, we'll, we'll certainly help you, uh, you know, pick the, the right tool for the job. And, um, you know, the, those, those tools are great. And then, but, you know, what, what we were able to do is kind of leverage some of the past experience we've had, you know, oh yeah, you know what, I just helped somebody two weeks ago that had a similar application, or I've got a customer that's been doing something similar for years and uh, we're able to kind of leverage that kind of stuff too. So um, we're, we're here to help <laughs> either way. Great. Thanks, guys. 
Uh, Ralph here asked a question. Thank you, Ralph. Um, basically, it's a two-part question. So I'll, I'll ask the first one. Um, what dictates whether you use an acrylic versus a polyurethane versus an epoxy um, when adhering painted or powder-coated steel and like component pieces? So uh, his concern, I, I guess I'll just jump in the whole question here. Uh, his concern is uh, the general public. I, I'm, and Ralph, you can elaborate on this a little bit more. Um, call us or email us anytime. But he said uh, the general public can come into contact with this, lean against it, or uh, impact it. Um, looks like they're fabricating decorative steel elements to railing components. So, you know, obviously there's some impact and some, some um, you know, touching and things like that. So where would, where would you start at least as far as selecting the right ad, uh, adhesive and, and what would you recommend for, for something in, in that application? Yeah, so you would really start with uh, how strong you, I'm assuming you would have some kind of test saying how strong you need that bond to be. And that would be your starting point. As far as uh, people touching it, once these adhesives are here, none of them are going to cause any kind of uh, any detrimental impact of if somebody touched it, like they'd have to wash their hands or something. Once these adhesives are here, they're, they're completely safe. And then also, if it's going to be exposed to any other environments, for, for example, like if, if it's uh, next to the ocean, if it's going to have saltwater spray or something, you're going to need that chemical resistance and that saltwater resistance. Um, most likely the, the MMAs or the epoxies are going to be able to have more chemical resistance and uh, better resistance to that. If, it, if you have, uh, depending on what the parts are, if it's just metal to metal, then epoxy or uh, MMA would work fine. If you need something that's going to be a little more flexible, that'd be the polyurethane. And um, depending on how the bond line is, um, if you want it to be clear, uh, if color is important, that's another factor that you can look at as well. Yeah, my personal opinion on, on that question is if uh, it truly is something that's going to be out in the elements and uh, surface prep is something that can be done to the powder coat, uh, I personally probably start with the epoxy line. Something maybe like the uh, 2015-1, it's a very, very tough end weather resistant product. Uh, the 2019 would also be something I would look at if a post here can be done on the uh, adhesive as well. So in, in terms of like long-term durability or, or anything like that, do you feel like once the product is, you know, so assuming you have a good epoxy choice or a good ac acrylic choice that, that bonds well to the substrates, once it's in a secured state and finished and, and in use, do you see any kind of durability difference or long-term performance of epoxy versus any, you know, epoxy versus acrylic versus urethane? Say that the epoxies are usually able to be more durable and they're going to be longer lasting uh the mmas are pretty good as well but the, the epoxies are really built for that i mean they're once they're there they're they're going to stay there for a long time it's going to be pretty much impossible to get rid of them right um so you know the other thing of that is is all the other stuff that goes into your process um, so one of the key differences between epoxies and acrylics is, is the, uh, the curve of the cure and the, the, the length of cure. So how fast do you need to get to that handling strength and how fast, how fast do you want to work with the materials? So there are some pretty fast epoxies, but typically with epoxies, the faster the epoxy that you get, um, usually they're not as strong. And again, these are big general terms. There might be exceptions, um, but Normally, if you want the strongest epoxy, those tend to be kind of longer open time products. Um, so if you want that combination of really high strength, but also really high fast, but really high speed and then high buildup, fast buildup of strength, um, that's where an acrylic maybe makes more sense. Uh, and so the, the thing that we look at is uh, the, the cure uh, curve. So in general terms, epoxies tend to have linear curves. So if you just plot on a, on a line chart, the, uh, the curing cycle at 100% cured, it's taken 100% of the cure time. At 50% of the curing time, it's 50% cured. You've hit 50% you've hit of your strength, et cetera. Where if you graph the way uh, acrylics bond, uh, build up strength, they're kind of more of a exponential curve where um, most of that strength accumulation happens in the first two hours in the first four hours or something. So if, if you need to glue this thing together and then within eight hours, this thing's gonna have some kind of stress uh, on it, um, then an acrylic might be a better choice. So 
kind of a long answer to a simple question, but those are the kinds of things in the process where that might help kind of guide. When I'm talking to people, those are the kinds of things, the questions I'm trying to ask to try and gauge, okay, what's the best fit for this application? Because in reality, it's a good question because there's a lot of overlap. There's probably a lot of applications where in reality, a, a urethane, an epoxy, or an acrylic could work. It's just a matter of what's best for you. Great, thanks, Andrew. <clears throat> Uh, I've got another great question here from an attendee. Uh, what product is recommended when bonding thin materials such as a, a 0.02 aluminum um, to avoid distortion due to heat? So that, that's, that's like what we call, Andrew, and you can elaborate on this, read through. There's a, a oil canning. I've heard that term. I don't know if you have any answers. Telegraphing. Yeah. yeah. What would you guys say to that? Yeah, I think, yeah, the 2053 and some of the other MMAs, you know, we've done some work where we try to mitigate the read-through issues. Uh, you know, automotive, that's a huge concern, of course, uh, especially when you're working with these newer composite parts and thermoplastic parts. Uh, it, again, I, I think it, it really comes down to testing out the particular substrates for those applications, which here in the lab, we're more than welcome uh, any, you know, submissions or, or questions for that pertaining to those specific applications because there, there's a lot of variability. But I, I think in general, uh, the 2053, uh, I've heard it's commonly been looked at for mitigating the read through. Yeah, and that's a, and that's a good suggestion because the, the big thing there is the uh, flexibility. So, um, you know, it's that, that um, you need a little bit of flexibility there to allow the parts to move without, because uh, what's happening there is that the, the parts are trying to move, the adhesive is rigid, it can't. So wherever that adhesive is, th that becomes a point where there's maybe a, a slight bow or a bend in the material. Um, so the more that that adhesive can compensate, uh, kind of the better. So uh, that's that's where kind of my head was 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 going to immediately when, when I saw the question. Um, yeah. That's great. Thanks, guys. Um, just a general question for me. I, I mean, I see that, you know, in the demos, we use those 50 milliliter, you know, cartridges. Um, you know, what kind of packaging sizes? Do you guys have bulk packaging sizes? Like what, what, what are the options for, for these engineers or applicators? Yeah, so uh, we have the, like you see the 50 mil cartridges. We also have uh, different uh, adhesives have different pack sizes, but we'll have a uh, 200 mil cartridges or 400 mil cartridges as well. And uh, also like port size or pail, and then also uh, in drum size bulk, uh, depending on the adhesive and what your needs are, uh, we probably have a pack size for you. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, and you, you know, uh, another thing that I just kind of want to say, since uh, you guys, if you guys are looking at applications involving adhesives, um, you know, we've tried to send some kind of communications out, trying to talk about basically the supply environment that we're in right now. Um, so just to kind of let everybody know if you if you're not aware obviously this you've probably seen on the news there's a lot of things impacting supply chains um, so it is kind of a tough time just in the chemical industry in general right now um, so my message to you guys is if you have an application that you're working on or you're looking for a right adhesive uh, just make sure to budget in as much time as you can into the process um, you know hopefully things kind of go back to you know, normal, whatever that means, uh, sooner than later. Um, but not just Huntsman, all the suppliers that we're working with, um, we're all kind of struggling with, you know, extended lead times, delays, and that kind of stuff. So very important in this planning phase to just kind of be aware of that, because um, what we'd hate to do is walk you through a whole process, um, find the right adhesive for you, and then it doesn't meet your timeline or, or something like that. So um, very important for everybody. Yeah, definitely make sure as soon as possible, if you have an application that you think you could use our adhesives, uh, bring us in as soon as quick as possible so we could, you know, get you in queue because we, we do have like backlog of customers that want adhesives and um, you want to make sure that you get in as soon as possible. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Uh, well, we're getting towards the top of the hour, which is the amount that we had budgeted. I, I see in the Q&A box, most of the questions have been answered. Um, any questions? Uh, Maybe we have time for one or two more. I, I see Ralph jumped in. Sure, yeah. Yeah, Ralph, um, he's asking, uh, he actually added a little bit to his application. He said, it's making flat stainless metal shields to go upright, to go on upright railing legs uh, to be used in a stadium um, where it can be banged and abused with, when people get out of hand, <laughs> which is known to happen here in Philadelphia, I'll tell you that much. Um, 
Yeah, it's got to be. It's got to be Philly tough. <laughs> Do you have any Philly tough adhesives, guys? <laughs> so uh, his uh, his question is: He's got these, you know, these shields, and they want to make sure they're not falling off these railing components. Um, so would there be a would there be a uh, an adhesive you guys would recommend for these shields to these railings? Yeah, I think uh, for that application, as long as you're willing to do a little surface prep, the 2015-1 yeah. would be a great adhesive for it. And um, with that surface prep, it's going to make a really strong bond. It's going to hold up to a lot of abuse. Uh, we'll see if it can hold up to <laughs> the Philly strong, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty That cool. remains to be seen. Yeah, I think that's a Philly tough adhesive. It is, it is a very, very resilient uh, system. So that would be what I'd lead off. So, yeah, I think the key is, is surface prep and option. I would highly recommend it if possible. If that's the type of environment and it's going to be beat on day after day and take a beating for many years, uh, 2015 would be a great fit for that application. Yeah. And good news going back to the supply issues, you know, we do have some 2015 in stock. So if that's something that you wanted to test out, um, we'd be able to uh, um, get that uh, in your hands sooner than later for you to be able to play around with it and, and see if it meets that that high bar that we're setting here. Yep. Um, okay. Any any other final questions? All right. I'll take that silence uh, forever. Hold your peace. All that. Um, uh, thanks. Thanks for all the questions, everybody. So, uh, all right. With that, we're ready to wrap up. So, a big thanks to Huntsman. Thanks to Matt Freeman. Thanks to Matt Pogue. Thanks to the whole rest of the Huntsman team behind the scenes that that helped get us here. Um, and thanks to everybody on my team to help make this possible. And of course, the biggest thanks uh, to you guys, the attendees for uh, sticking with us <laughs> uh, literally and hearing um, uh, a little bit, learning a little bit more about the, these products and, and hopefully you found it valuable. So again, you're going to get some communications from us, including a recording, including the PDF. And uh, you'll be hearing from us uh, shortly to see if there's anything we can help you with. Uh, thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. Take care, everybody. So long.